Now I want to talk about the neocons in greater depth. For your reading pleasure, I've included a bibliography below the screen. In the 1990s, Richard Haas, a longtime Bush operative, spoke in favor of the sheriff and his posse as the most cost-effective means of exploiting U.S. hegemony. Haas predicted with stunning accuracy the imperial policy of Bush II a decade later. The use of collaborators in an empire of in informal rule. The sheriff being the United States and the posse being a coalition of the willing. William Crystal and Robert Kagan advised fellow conservatives in 1996 to embrace a more elevated vision of America's international role. Their idea was something they called benevolent global hegemony, in which the American hegemon was defined as a leader with preponderant influence and authority over all others in its domain. To preserve international peace, it was necessary for the United States government to use its military power to dominate the earth. Americans were not sufficiently militarized or indoctrinated into an appropriate appreciation of the U.S. military and its great sacrifices. Sacrifices for world peace. U.S. hegemony would be undermined if the people were indifferent and did not understand their mission to spread democracy, free trade, and liberty. A world shaped according to American interests. It was simply cowardice and dishonor to stay at home while un-American principles were allowed to stalk the planet. God gave America the responsibility to lead the world. And it was time once again, as in the Cold War, for American leaders to be heroes like Ronald Reagan and Teddy Roosevelt. It was a question of honor and patriotism to fulfill the call of American exceptionalism. The rhetoric of Crystal and Kagan shared the hallmarks of imperialist precepts found throughout history. The call to honor, the call to heroic action, increased money and respect for the military, a frank admission of goals, chief of which is world domination, belief in supernatural forces guiding imperial policy and sanctioning conquest of the weak, the summoning of national icons to inspire the current generation in calls to emulate their alleged policies, the cloaking of extortion and exploitation in the name of patriotism, peace through strength. The popular phrase for agitators such as Crystal was neoconservative. Those who preached a militant brand of conservatism disseminated in Washington think tanks by a small group of 25 to 30 white men, almost all of them Jewish. It is taboo in the United States to mention that neocons are obsessed with Israeli national security which they and Bush II had placed ahead of human rights. They believed the Iraq War in 2003 should be fought to consolidate a new world order and to create a new Middle East in America's image. Iraq was only step one. As Charles Krauthammer said, the United States had to rebuild the Middle East into a liberal democracy. And like other neocons, he believed America had left the Arabs alone for too long. Kagan and Crystal did not alter their imperialist justification for invading Iraq even after the invasion. Their position was based on the belief that Saddam Hussein was an obstacle to progress and a threat to U.S. troops in the region, a threat to American allies, a threat to the stability of the Middle East, and of course, the world supply of oil. Kagan and Crystal even added a new reason. Mass graves in Iraq were sufficient to justify an invasion, indicating a trend in neocon thinking that ex post facto reasons were needed to buttress a flawed policy. For neocons, it was necessary for U.S. imperialism to advance the career of Israel, and this is uh, unique in the history of imperialist philosophy, that a country on the periphery, not operated by the metropole is vital to the interests of the metropole, in this case Israel to the United States. Most neocons were pro-Likud Zionists who advocated more than just regime change in Iraq. 
They wanted Bush the second to attack and destroy Syria, Iran, the Palestinian Authority, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. These were all, incidentally, enemies of Israel. From the anxiety of being the only global hegemon, the neocons fabricated a strategy for the United States that emphasized its military projection and Israeli security as the only path to Middle East stability and preservation of oil flow. They thought the Bush interest in Iraq in 2003 should be change in the Middle East, a pro-American regime in Iraq, safe oil supply, and relief of Israel. It should be apparent that most writers on the Iraq 2003 invasion trace Bush policy to neocon ideas and most integrate lust for Arab oil fields. For Leon Hadar, the USA was being manipulated by pro-Israel neocons, pro-Saudi oil lobby, but there was no reason for the United States government to continue following their lead and remain stuck in a Cold War paradigm. The neocons did more than anyone else to get the United States involved in a Middle Eastern imperial fantasy after 9-11. Their power under Bush II had miserable consequences. Fanatical support for Israel, imperial overstretch in the Middle East, hatred for America among Arabs and the rest of the Middle East, and increased terrorism. These old neocon cold warriors had been suffering terribly since the 1990s from enemy deprivation syndrome. The same conservatives who had preached against big government believed the United States could produce free trade and democracy and the Middle East, which was nothing less than social engineering. Robert Kaplan tried to explain in his The Coming Anarchy the power of violence exerted in war had positive value for Americans whose youth needed to be in the military to slake a natural thirst for killing. Kaplan urged Americans to reject the United Nations and act ruthlessly against evil. Because Kaplan failed to define evil, this led to a problem of floating definitions in which the accuser and the enforcer control the definition of evil, opening the way for abuses as seen under such leaders as Stalin and Bush II. Support for U.S. empire was widespread among conservative writers after the Bush regime took over in 2001. Max Boot, who in the Trump era wrote against American imperialism, had a different view back in the days of Bush II. In 2003, he wrote, What American imperialism? No need to run away from that label. He urged Americans to get used to the idea of permanent U.S. garrisons in Iraq is part of the price of success. As of 2020, they were still there. Some conservatives, such as Christopher Preble, did not see the need for imperial troops in the Gulf, especially after 2003. He thought oil will find its way to consumers regardless of who has military power. There was no need for the United States to be running the Middle East. The Gulf powers should police their own region and not depend on the U.S. government. The declared mission of George Bush in invading Iraq was the toppling of Saddam Hussein and the elimination of weapons of mass destruction, not babysitting democracy in the Middle East. Their oil was going to come to market regardless of the type of government. Along these lines, Clyde Prestowitz, a Reagan official and U.S. nationalist, called America a rogue nation which went off track into unilateralism, provoking distrust and contempt among nations. It was counterproductive for the United States under Bush II to depart from traditions of multilateralism. America was not designed to be a world empire. Americans never really became comfortable with the habit of empire and simply are not good imperialists. Conservatives such as Victor Hansen even denied that the United States was an empire. U.S. military bases all over the world were peaceful, meant only to keep the sea lanes open. The U.S. government does not want colonies. Rome and Britain wanted empire, but the American people disdained empire. American character is not imperialist.
The United States military is larger than anyone else's because the economy simply allows it. America does not exploit, it spreads peace and replaces evil regimes with democracies. American culture is inimical to hierarchy and privilege, which threatens Islamist regimes. This is your Empire Historian, Frank H. Wallace, Ph.D. Thank you for listening and thinking.